Hi there, I'm the Myth Keeper. Welcome back to my channel. This week we're continuing our series on religion and the world of Pathfinder. Uh, I'm doing this using my own system, uh, so it's not Pathfinder canon. Uh, the first three videos were about what I call the Celestial Pantheon. That's 12 gods that I think are kind of at the core of the universe. Uh, this uh, series is going to continue this week with uh, me starting to look at the Lesser Gods, which is another set of 12 gods. I'm tackling six this week, and I'm tackling the other six next week. Uh, I think it's some cool content here. All the gods here are interesting. They're worth your time, so enjoy. As I discussed in my first video on religion, some time ago I developed the mnemonic device to help me remember the main gods in the world of Galarian. I finished the Big 12 in my last video, so I'm moving on to another group of gods that I call the Lesser Gods. My concept here was that I could align the secondary gods in positions that would roughly align with corresponding main gods. So Milani corresponds to Aomide, Grotus to Phrasma, Bismara to Gazre, and so on. I found this worked better in some places than other places, but regardless, I started with the system, so I'm going to stick with it. So moving on to the lesser gods, today I'm covering the gods of good prospect, which includes Milani, Caden, Kalian, and Grandmother Spider. I'm also covering the gods of skill and prowess, which includes Besmara, Kyrgyz, and Gorim. Today I'm starting with Milani. Milani the Everbloom is a goddess of devotion, hope, and uprising. Her symbol is a rose blooming from bloodstained soil. Like Iomide and Erasne, the goddess Milani was one of Aradin's saints, who served the god of progress and humanity loyally while he reigned. She was the beacon of hope to all those who fought against repressive regimes, giving courage to those who had little but their desire to live a free life. The death of her patron, combined with the tremendous upheaval and suffering that followed his death, gave her a focus and attracted many new followers. Those devoted to her found the courage to organize rebellions against the infernal takeover of the Chelish Empire helping many of her outlying territories to break free of its control. They fought against the slow slide into barbarism, restoring people's hope that just and good society could be restored. Milani has never been as popular as Aradin's other followers, particularly Iomide, whom she considers an older sister. The inheritor herself also refers to Milani as her sister, and she is always ready to support her should the need arise. Milani's holy text is The Light of Hope, often split into two sections. One outlines Milani's history as a mortal, penned after she became a saint, and the second, given by divine revelation to her most loyal followers after she became a goddess, includes teachings for mortals in the form of sermons, prayers, and songs. Traditionally, pressed roses serve as bookmarks in the text, and rose petals are placed in the book to mark special pages when the text is given as a gift. Milani is the patron mother of those who war against oppression, rewarding those willing to sacrifice their lives and use whatever tools are available to fight for those who cannot defend themselves, especially people who have been captured or enslaved. Milani's church is not organized in a traditional structure. Rather, because they fight against oppressors, they are traditionally organized into clandestine cells of freedom fighters. Clerics of Milani often own or work in subtle businesses or organizations cleverly designed as fronts to cover their efforts to cleanse a region of oppressors, or liberate those who have been enslaved or victimized. As a subtle tell to other Milanites of the structure's true intent, these buildings usually feature a small rose garden or other rose iconography. One of the most famous and oldest of these safe havens is an inn in Absalom known as the Sanguine Thorn, which served as a staging point for hundreds of successful liberation attempts in the area. Her church is generally most popular in areas of intense upheaval, such as Galt, the River Kingdoms, and Cheliacs, in secret, of course. Officially, her church is banned in Cheliacs. The faithful generally only gather in small congregations. In peacetime, her followers demonstrate their obedience by planting and cultivating roses or brewing and sharing tea, then praying to her while inhaling their scent. During conflicts, Milanites train for battle alongside their allies. Clergy in service to Milani generally have intense periods of work and proselytizing in troubled regions, followed by years of tranquility once they achieve their goals. They are aware that their calling often ends in martyrdom, and it is a common belief that those who are strong of faith will return again to continue the fight. Many clerics of Milani believe that they are a new incarnation of a martyr of the church, and can in fact access memories from their previous life. Caden Kalian, the lucky drunk, is a god of ale, freedom, and bravery. His symbol is a mug of ale. Once a mortal human, Caden Kalian is now one of the few deities known as the Ascended, in his mortal years, Caden was a sellsword of no small fame, known for his boisterous manner, skill with a blade, and fearless resolve. 
During a particularly rowdy night of drinking, a series of escalating dares led the wandering mercenary to attempt the test of the Starstone. He emerged from the Starstone Cathedral three days later, laughing, a fully realized god. Divine responsibility did little to change Caden's attitude from what it was in his mortal life. He continues to crave adventure, drink, and pleasurable company, while abhorring bullies, tyrants, and cowards. Caden has no formal churches or structured clergy, but simple shrines to him appear in almost every tavern and roadside inn. Many of his priests own such businesses and offer healing to patrons, some of whom may have been injured during a drunken brawl. While Caden's faith is a charitable one, Cadenites still seek payment for such services. At the very least, the injured party is expected to purchase a round of drinks for the house. Only in places where worshippers of the accidental god are in direct opposition to the local powers, such as where a rebellion is forming under a tyrant's nose, is his church out of the public eye. Cadenites can bring themselves to be quiet in the face of oppression only for so long, and once a rebellion reaches full bloom, the god's silver tankard is often proudly displayed across every bar. As a mortal, Caden often found himself at odds with the work he was hired to perform, and abandoned jobs that went against his conscience. This gave him a reputation for being unreliable among his more unscrupulous employers, but it garnered significant respect from clients with stronger morals. Legends tell of him taking contracts to free entire crews of slaves, undoing the operations of predatory business owners, and other rebellious deeds for the good of the common folk. His worshippers often involve themselves in similar matters, safeguarding the freedom and prosperity of working-class people, overthrowing tyrants, and helping the oppressed relocate to freer lands. His champions, in particular, embed themselves in nations with harsh laws and stir up rebellions, often from the back room of a tavern. Members of Caden's faith also maintain many orphanages in urban areas, arranging them to receive funds from local pubs and other Caden-friendly establishments. Not much is known about Caden's childhood as a mortal, but given his patronage of such houses, many have inferred that he spent at least some of his time in an orphanage when he was young. While the children in such orphanages are not expressly raised in the faith, most adopt the god's teachings when they grow old enough to leave. These individuals often take the surname Kalian to honor him, adding to the number of gregarious rebels in the world. While the consumption of alcohol is central to most of Caden's worship, drinking to excess and dependency on drink are seen as misuse of the accidental god's gifts. Clergy who develop such an addiction are encouraged by their community to take a large role in the faith's other work, such as maintaining orphanages or supporting rebel efforts, and those who recover often work to assist others with their own recovery from alcoholism. Though being the god of alcohol is a popular aspect of Caden Kalian, members of his faith often find personal freedom and rejection of tyranny just as appealing as a strong drink, and it is not uncommon for teetotalers to number among Caden's followers. Caden is not particular about who worships him, so long as they abide by the simple expectations of freedom, bravery, and enjoying a good drink. As such, he has followers from almost all ancestries. A good number of his worshippers are half-orcs, who find the casual tenets and welcoming nature of the faith to be a good fit for those who have been ostracized from more stringent communities. His followers are typically good-natured, boisterous, and optimistic. Life simply holds too much to take in for anyone to spend it gloomy. Many adventurers find Caden's tenants to be a natural fit, taking jobs when they can and bucking cruelty wherever they find it. Grandmother Spider Nana Anadi, also known as Grandmother Spider, or the Weaver, is a goddess of family, stories, twilight, and weaving. Her symbol is a diamond-shaped strand of web. Grandmother Spider began her existence as a servant of the other gods, meant to weave fate and reality into existence. Infuriated at her position as a lackey, she made fools of the greater gods through mischief and disruption. She stole and copied Asmodeus' keys, resulting in widespread chaos. She pilfered some of Sarenrae's fire, leading numerous followers astray. Nimbly avoiding any retribution for her antics, Grandmother Spider rewove the strands of fate for herself, gaining her freedom. She regularly pleads with her brother Achekek to follow her lead and rebel against the gods, and while he always refuses, seemingly indifferent, Achekek has on one notable occasion proven vengeful towards those who harm his sister or her followers. Worship of Grandmother Spider is relatively rare in Avistan. She is particularly disliked by Asmodeus, who is the patron god of Cheliags. However, she is quite revered in Garand, and among the Anadi, spider-like humanoids, whose ancestors she led through the darkness and into freedom. Grandmother Spider has few dedicated temples. Her places of worship are instead typically schools, and small roadside or home shrines consisting of a spider figurine, a loom, or a woven object. Woven diamond shapes, patterned after Grandmother Spider's religious symbol, 
can also be found tucked inside the temples of other deities, especially those belonging to the Ascended, those gods who were once mortal. Grandmother Spider emphasizes self-reliance, learning, cunning, and caring for family and community. She is intolerant of bullying and slavery, and disdains inherited hierarchy and titles. Her holy book is called The Old Woman Makes the Stars, Written by an Anadi cleric named Raindrop Singer Name between the 2nd and 4th century AR, this epic poem features the opening line shared among all of the many stories of Grandmother Spider. This I have heard, and heard once more, and so I think it is true. Followers of Grandmother Spider enjoy sitting around a fireplace late at night telling these stories. Gorum, the Lord in Iron, is a god of battle, strength, and weapons. His symbol is a smoldering sword embedded in stone. The clash of steel, the cry of victory, the gasping denial of death, these are the sounds of prayers to our lord in iron, for to follow Gorham is to fight. Gorham does not care the reason for battle. A village's desperate stand against raiders is no less worthwhile to him than a crusader's army marching against demons in the Sarkora Scar, nor does he choose sides in such clashes. Good or evil, law or chaos, the reason for the fight is irrelevant. It is the thrill of battle that finds his favor, the crucible of struggle, in which victory is there for the taking. Gorham recognizes the value of strategic warfare, and the need for archery, siege weapons, and stealth, but those hold little allure for him compared to hand-to-hand -hand combat, the contest of raw brute strength against honed deadly skill. Gorham takes no pleasure in one-sided fights or the slaughter of innocents, an armored knight drawing a sword in his name against a helpless peasant might find his blade rust away. Far more delightful would be the peasant's seemingly pointless swing of an iron pot, which might be answered as if it were spoken prayer and transformed into a deadly blow. The god's followers hold that one is either brave or a coward, with battle the threshing floor that separates the wheat from the chaff. Death in battle is an honor. While tactical retreats or even breaks in fighting to negotiate are tolerable, no greater shame can befall a person than to flee from combat. Murder and assassination similarly offer no honor, and Gorham feels nothing but contempt for those practices, as well as for Achekek and Norgorber, who condone them. The god and his followers likewise look on Urgothoa with disdain, as her diseases steal lives in the sickbed, and the gluttony she promotes destroys warriors' fitness for meaningful battle. Gorham's followers are innumerable. Soldiers, mercenaries, knights, raiders, all across the inner sea offer him tribute, especially in places where battle is an everyday way of life, such as Belkson, the lands of the Linarm kings, the realms of the mammoth lords, and the gravelands. Believers claim that the god spirits live in iron and gird themselves in metal armor when possible. They fight frequently, though not always to the death. Battle can establish dominance, relieve tension, or even just serve as a prayer. His priests are hard to differentiate from his followers. They commonly wear armor, or heavy robes that incorporate metal, as their vestments, and are adorned with all manner of weapons, making them walking arsenals ready to draw steel at the slightest opportunity. Though Gorham has no sacred text, his followers learn the church's creed from a collection of seven heroic poems called the Gorham Skagat. Each verse keeps to a rhythm that remains the same across all translations, which warriors learn to recognize and chant while on the march. These chants harmonize into the haunting sound of a roaring battle, and Goramite warbands take great pride in chants that suggest great conflicts. Battle is the true language of Goram, acting as the great unifier, and it differs little whether fought by those speaking Shoanti or Dwarven. Goram's clerics preach that should all battle ever end, Goram would abandon Galarian, only to return when mortals inevitably clash again. His most holy sites are battlefields, consecrated by the struggles, blood, and lives of those fighting on them. His temples resemble fortresses, complete with armories and forges, even those in the midst of peaceful cities. They contain images of the god, often pictured as a suit of spiked plate armor with burning red eyes. Shrines to him are simple, a pile of stones capped with a metal helm or a blade jammed into a crevice. Among adventurers, most Goramites are humans or half-orcs, though followers can be found among all ancestries. They are valued companions thanks to their skill at defeating foes, even though violence tends to be their first answer to every problem. They typically set out not in search of great treasure, but rather to find challenges, test their mettle, and honor their god in glorious combat. The most fortunate prove themselves by emerging from battle victorious time and time again, but even these are more likely to be slain on the battlefield than to retire and fade away into old age. Kerges. 
Kerges, the strong man, is a god of healthy competition, bravery, and sport. His symbol is a flexing arm holding a golden chain. Once a mortal farm boy from Taldor, who had superhuman strength from youth, Kerges's selfless sacrifice on the field of competition heralded his rise to godhood. Kerges stands as both a champion and shining example to those who seek athletic achievement and to give their all in competition, regardless of whether they are victorious or not. Whether they're priests or lay believers, followers of Kerges believe that the strength of body and strength of character are the twin pillars that flank the gates of Nirvana, and most train tirelessly to achieve these ideals. Worshippers of Kerges revel in their strength, eager to show off. This is motivated less by pride, however, than by a desire to inspire others to strive for their own potential. While the teachings of Kerges emphasize physicality, wizards and other students of magic occasionally find inspiration in the strong man's example, delving into the study of magic with the same zeal more traditional worshippers apply to physical exercises. Some spellcasters believe that keeping one's body in good shape helps keep one's mind just as sharp, and they actively seek to bolster their physical prowess as part of their path towards developing their mental acuity and endurance. Regardless of their methods, followers of Kerges are commonly jovial and encouraging, even to their rivals, and their companions often cannot help but be inspired by their enthusiasm. While followers of Kerges are willing to demonstrate their strength in combat, especially to protect others or to defend their ideals, followers of the strong man take no pleasure in mortal combat, or the deaths of even the most dire enemies. By and large, a light-hearted lot, followers of Kerges prefer training games and friendly competition to war and bloody conflict. When the need arises, however, Followers of Kerges can be found on the front lines of combat and heroic orders such as the Knights of Last Wall. Even though priests of the strong man are always welcome in the temples of Desna and Caden Kalian, Kerges's clergy are generally itinerants who travel between sporting events, fairs, and tournaments. They carry with them small, brightly colored portable shrines in the form of puppet theaters or wooden podiums, usually with a place for depositing donations. While at these competitions, priests treat sports injuries and make sure that events are run as cleanly as possible. They also provide minor healing to adventurers for free, providing they regale them with stories of their brave and just accomplishments, or beat them in a test of strength. Most also learn a craft, such as woodworking, creating small dolls and other toys to give to children at these events. Because the Church of the Strong Man has only been active for a few hundred years, it does not put much emphasis on structure and rigidly defined dogma. This makes it popular among those who wish to do good without the restrictions of elaborate ritual or hierarchy. Kerges is also popular among archers, athletes, entertainers, jousters, mercenaries, scouts, and messengers. And today we conclude with Besmara. Besmara, the pirate queen, is a goddess of piracy, sea monsters, and strife. Her symbol is a black flag bearing a skull and crossbones. Besmara is a goddess most commonly worshipped by the sailor folk of the Shackles or Ilismagorti. She is said to captain her legendary ship Sea Wraith throughout the seas and waterways of the Great Beyond, especially the Maelstrom, making raids on places such as Hell, Elysium, Axis, and even Heaven. Although pirates don't tend to be a very religious lot, they will often call on her on their deathbed, or if in extreme danger. Priests of Besmara generally also are captains of their own raiding ships, and have a fierce reputation, although some have retired and opened small chapels of Besmara in places frequented by pirates. Once nothing more than a powerful spirit of water with the ability to manipulate sea monsters, Besmara grew slowly in power over the centuries from sacrifices made by seafaring people. After defeating and consuming rival spirits of battle, gold, and wood, she became a minor goddess of piracy, strife, and sea monsters. Besmara, the pirate queen, cuts a brash and bold figure, as she is often depicted wearing buccaneer apparel consisting of loose-fitting, eye-catching clothing and black boots, and her hair is wind-tossed even on the calmest days. She and her followers adhere to a simple code of greed. Take what you desire, no matter who it might belong to. Despite this, Besmara and her worshippers are generally loyal to each other, knowing that while on the waves raiding ships for treasure, a pirate crew can only survive if its members trust one another. Besmara is no fool. She knows to fall back if obtaining a certain treasure proves too difficult. In fact, she currently bides her time, waiting for an opportunity to gain more deific power, even while she steals from other minor divinities. She's not above fighting dirty if she believes it will give her the upper hand in a battle, and she can sometimes encourage her followers to foment conflict between other groups so they can take advantage of the ensuing chaos. Besmara thrives in areas where piracy is difficult to control or even encouraged, such as Ilismagorti and the Shackles, and her followers chafe at any laws that would curtail their personal freedoms. Most of Besmara's followers are those who live their lives in and around the seas of Galarian, typically pirates or others whose livelihood relies on piracy. 
This includes both the vilest of high seas murderers and the privateers who seek them out. However, even non-followers utter prayers to the pirate queen as they set sail or as storms approach. Besmara rarely cares when those of other faiths are at sea, so long as she receives respect and her fair share of tribute from treasure. And that's the first half of my Lesser Gods of Galarian. The second half is coming at you next week. And after that, we're going to start looking at some evil gods. So that'll be fun. Watch out for that coming soon. If you enjoyed this content, be sure to like and subscribe, and I'll catch you next time.